First of all, thank you for being here. I will try to talk quickly. Uh, one of the great things about Can't hear you. being a uh, yeah, raise the mic a little bit. It's good to have students with skills to fall back on. <laughs> you all are very patient, and I will be fairly quick. Uh, there are three things I want to do. I want to say a few things about the chip, but I want to say why they are so important, what they have to offer you. And then I want to say, offer a suggestion to all of you about a totally different approach to evaluation and research that can help uh, build evidence for your product, make you think clearly about your product to the degree you're interested in kids. I think we're in the middle of a potential revolution, uh, sort of a revolution in that regard. And lastly, I want to ask your help in tracking down more chip technologies and more bug lighters, particularly for our hybrid PhD, and I'll say a bit more about that. So those three <coughs> things I'll move fairly quickly and may not make any sense, but they would have told you that already. Um, the, um, I'm sorry? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Um, what I wanted to uh, do then, I'm advancing here, nothing's happening. There we go. Okay. Um, at the deep level, there's a big tension in the field of psychology between theories of learning, theories of development. What you've heard today from Chip and you've heard from Warren when he talks about Montessori. Developmental psychologists tend to look at the big picture, the whole context, the family, growth over time. Learning theories stereotypically look at sort of shorter term, does the child learn algebra, does the child learn to spell or read. Um, I will argue that, or I want you to think that, the more you can spend time thinking like a developmentalist. You develop products, you say they learn something, but broaden your scope, think about where does this fit into the developmental, how does it connect with the family, uh, and so on. So a developmental perspective is what you've really heard from Chip about, and it animates a, a deep divide in the way many people think about learning. This is the, uh, the quick nostalgia bit. You already heard a bunch of that. It is worth uh, noting that Chip worked with me in Wisconsin, oh my God. bought the first Apple II ever sold in Wisconsin. I had to argue with the chair of the computer science department and my dean. <laughs> And when I told her I needed another disk drive, she went crazy. She thought, is there no end to these costs? <laughs> what, what would be, I could take a moment and show uh, a little video of Chip working with this thing. You may notice there's a video disk player. We got the first laser disk from the Smithsonian. The guy says it's got 50,000 pictures on it. Nobody at the Smithsonian knows why I'm doing this. He was chief of photographic services. He said, can you do something? I said, yeah, I'll make a talking word processor. I handed it to Chip said, Chip, they don't even have an index. Make an index. I'm heading off to California for a conference. When I got back, I said, Chip, what's on there? And he had a yellow pad, and he was out to 1,400. And I said, he's, he's writing down what these pictures are. I said, Chip, what have you been doing? And he looked at me like, I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been looking at this video. And it suddenly clicked that if you looked at each picture for one minute, and you've got 55,000 pictures, it turns out you'd have to work a 40-hour week for about a half a year, just once. And it's one of the first feelings I had, like we're into a whole new world. So we did make that thing work, but if I show you a little clip, you'll see how strange it is, how hard it was to make it as friendly as Warren was saying, you must make your products. <laughs> so I'm so jealous of uh, where people are today. Uh, so I might try to get back to that. Uh, <laughs> That's boring. Warren and Chip, of course, brought more to me than I, I brought to them. But um, again, what I wanted to emphasize, if you look at Chip Donahue, he started working, running a Montessori school, deep passion for children, a lot of time with children. His dissertation was a, a study that helped inform one of the largest child development systems on the planet. Um, Warren worked on the, the Ypsilanti project with uh, David Weikert, 
It's the first study that got the wide freedom of saying that you can make a difference in children's lives if you start in preschool. So both of them are deeply, deeply grounded in child development. And this I'd say to all of you, if you are thinking you're designing software and not spending a lot of time with your own children, your nephews, your nieces, preschools, and so on, or adding people to your staff, you will miss that deep grounding in what a day in the life of a child is like. I would, I would add that uh, this is a picture of me with my little kids with the Apple II. Um, many people, are, I, I know, for example, Frank Lloyd Wright said the magic of the Montessori blocks are in my mind. I'm convinced that programming the little Apple II, who took my son on to computer science at Stanford, and V line and H line, and the ability to make something is not dichotomous whether it's physical or virtual. And the argument that, that, that Chip mentioned is a very profound one in early childhood. Uh, but the human brain, you know, all of what we see right here is brought in through senses, and the real construction is up in our, our brain. So there's the, the famous Woodland Montessori. And as Chip mentioned, even then I was looking for smart graduate students. And I'll come back around to how the hybrid PhD will enable us to draw people from your industry without them having to quit their life and work to go move to East Lansing. So here's the one of the big messages, and it has to do with how you're thinking about your software. Everything is moving online. If you're still thinking of selling boxes or plugins or whatever, you don't understand that everything is moving online and it's accelerating. I can show you the graph of the growth of online instruction at Michigan State. If you're not aware of it, online K-12 is growing at about 30 or 40 percent a year. People are pulling their kids out of school, they're homeschooling them, they're doing, schools are buying online courses so kids can take courses that they can't offer. And so as you think about your future, the more you think virtual, online, in the cloud, the longer term prospects are for your having a major impact. Um, so, if you haven't read the book Disrupting Class, for example, it predicts that within about 10 years, half of all high school instruction will move online. And these are, I, I was skeptical, but the curves are mapping pretty clear what, closely to what these uh, people wrote. I teach a course for undergraduates on integrating technology into schools. And one of the things I kept saying, online is going to make a difference in your future. This woman came up to me at a conference two or three years later and said, remember you said that? I didn't believe a word of it. <laughs> and she said, you know what I'm doing now? And I said, no. She said, I'm teaching a fifth grade class, completely online, 30 kids, 15 are Title I, 15 are not. And I went, whoa, you're even ahead of me. Um, online learning is really not only moving from what was a virtual high school to a virtual middle school to elementary school, but online providers are gaining market share at a remarkable pace. Huge potential for disruption for good and, and evil. But um, Emily, uh, her account and the, the window on that world of industry providing online learning for K-12, most people in my college of education have no idea how fast it's going. And it will, again, open up ways that you can think to the degree you realize that you have a way of reaching into homes with your products. Now here's, here's, so, so here's the, the pitch I'd really like to make to you. Online environments, online software, can provide the education experiment station we've never had. And it maps the delivery system onto the research system so that if you find results, they replicate. That, that it is the environment itself, so you don't have to go into a classroom and, and do research, get one class with the software, one without, group of 30 kids, and so forth. If we really think through how to, each of you can make your products yield evidence of their own effectiveness, and do it automatically, cumulatively, online, it would build, it would first of all force you to validate your theories. It would force you to say, does my product really teach? What do I mean by what the kids are learning? But it would be the research paradigm that would enable us to get way beyond the designs that most of us are learning in our PhD programs across the country. And so 
Um, it is worth mentioning that child development, out of which Montessori and all of this work uh, can, can, can be placed, developed out of home economics. And if you're to place like University of Wisconsin, Madison, or Michigan State, these land-grant universities were set up with a mandate to not only raise smarter peas and corns and chickens, but to raise smarter children. And the Rockefeller Foundation put a lot of work into child development, teaching mothers how to better nutrition and all of that. Um, a lot of the research designs are quite interesting because they're sort of split plot where you put the fertilizer on or not. In your products, you can switch that on and off the way Warren switched on and off a talkative, intrusive narrator. So, and here's another thing. Any of you have done research in classrooms, you go out, you videotape, or you try to get a big grant to uh, do that sort of thing. Very expensive, very complicated, hard to control, even if you find a result. Was it due to the teacher? Was it the classroom? Was it the kids? If we move to understanding individual learning and the software products you're giving out and you're putting in front of people, we can then accumulate individual paths that show that, that these things work and you can switch things on or off as a, as a research tool. So it ties in also, I would mention, with the whole move towards data visualization, business analytics. If you follow anything in the business world, data dashboards are becoming hugely prominent. Your products ought to have a data dashboard. A parent ought to be able to click on your product and it should bring up things like your child has spent the following amount of time in this software environment. If you were really good, you would be randomly sampling from activities and say, compared to two weeks ago, your child now knows the following words. Or your child's speed of doing certain things has gone up. That's all right within reach. And it's especially powerful if it's done online because the data can then be aggregated and shared. So think hard about that. There's a whole new world of learning. And the, the crux of it is I've concluded that we will learn almost nothing about educational software in schools. Uh, one of the biggest studies funded by the, uh, the you know, the Institute for Education Research took a really good product designed at Carnegie Mellon for learning algebra. Big expense, put it in classroom, half had it, half didn't, concluded there was only modest evidence of effectiveness. But when you drill down, the kids only got to use it about 10 hours in the course of a year. It's there, but schools are running in 55 minute periods, 180 days, fire alarms going off, and huge within class vari variation. So change that around, take the same product, bring in individual kids, bring them in online, track change over time feed the time will change back in a constructive way, and you'll be developing evidence for the efficacy of your product in a way that, in a sense, can't be disputed. It won't answer the question, would it work in a noisy classroom where they don't let them use it, or well, the computers don't work. It will show that your software does work. And I would add, there will be, ultimately, great economic value to those of you who can do that kind of evidence. Many products I see in Warren Reviews They'll say something like, show them effective, and then you say, where was it? It was 12 children in some school in Berkeley or something. If you can begin to say, if your child spends this amount of time, we have evidence that they will get better at the following things. It will cause you to think better, but it will actually help sell your product. Does great economic value mean get rich? Um, Is that it means, the translation? It means, means finding a better place when you go on to, another, to a better world. Oh, I see. <laughs> That is, one, one of the problems is it's much easier to hold people's attention if it's just fun than it is to create environments in which they have the peace and quiet to work and are expected to do something productive. I asked my 50 undergraduates on a survey this semester, how many of you have a, web, a Facebook page? Every single hand. How many of you write a blog? Two out of 50. I asked how many of you have a, a website where you put up work that you've done in your program, two out of 50. So it is not, it is much easier to receive than to give, I think is the way to think about it. Anyhow, I could go into great detail, this is a research methodologist and all of that, but I, if you get the point that you have the capacity of putting your work online, gathering data in real time, feeding it back in meaningful ways to the learner, to the parents, and to the research community. Um, there's a whole literature now on motivation, most, what happens in schools, 
you show up in the classroom, the classroom will uh, maintain a bell-shaped distribution in the classroom. If you come in privileged or smart, you will end up with the A's. And if you come in from a disadvantaged background, time held constant, you will end up with the C. What's different on the web and online after school nights and weekends is the child can work longer and work towards criteria, learning a subject as opposed to learning as much of the subject as others in the class. Because you may be in a dumb class or a smart class. What schools do is say they're teaching algebra, but they're not actually teaching to criteria, they're teaching to the norm of that class. What really matters is the ipsative, which means compared to yourself yesterday, do you know more today than you knew yesterday? And if we could change our education system to an ipsative form, you see that you're making progress, you see you're making progress towards criterion, not are you as smart as the others in your class. So that's the idea of it. It taken to its most extreme form, and this would be for the graduate students that are in here, or the doctoral students that we recruit thanks to you. Ideally, we would take a, a high-quality research publication from something like the Journal of Child Development, reverse engineer it, write the article before the students run the thing, and your software online would be feeding data cumulatively into the analysis of variance. And so that with each passing week, the end would go up. It's that kind of thinking, do you really know what your product teaches? Do you really care whether your students are learning anything? And if you do, could you measure it? And if you can measure it, can you generate an output that encourages the student and, motive and, and persuades the parents and ultimately persuades the research community that experience in your software really makes a difference in kids' lives? So I'll give you two or three or four just real quick things about what we can do online that you can't do in classrooms. These are data from Michigan Virtual School, where the students, that's the fastest growing thing in across the country, 34 states now have virtual high schools. People are flocking to those. What, what Blackboard, or just the fact that this an online environment enables, is you know at a fine-grained level what each kid is doing. So for example, in this one class, that's the number of clicks per day by day of week. And you can see that some kids are working on Saturday and Sunday at home, others are not. The class is very hugely in that dimension. The teachers who understood they could really make their course work weekends got more clicks out of their students than those who did not. And this is what's really interesting. How some of those of you have been teachers, those of your parents, how much do you know about what time of day your student is learning? Well, what we found was some kids are working at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, weekends, and so on, in these online environments. If you want to learn algebra, you go to school Monday through Friday, 55 minute period. That's the classroom. You go online, you're someone who wants to stay up late and really master quadratic equations, you can do so. So these kinds of data displays are enabling us to gather real insights into individual in a way you just can't do it in the classroom. When I was teaching in the lab, I had 50 kids in high school and 200 in middle school. And you can't look out at that many kids and differentiate instruction, even though that's what the gifted and talented people say we should do is differentiate instruction. This um, Robin, uh, sitting next to Chip, organized virtual summer camps through the virtual high school and in, in, uh, virtual school in Michigan. And it was a marvelous experience. Students signed up for two week blocks they created a playful environment where they checked into cabins and they had access to math and science gizmos. And that's a trademark, G-I-Z-M-O, if you look it up. As a former high school physics chemistry teacher, I would have loved to have that. Kids spent as much time as they wanted exploring these gizmos. And one of the most moving stories, and this is why it gets back to Chip's point, that it really depends a woman from inner city Detroit, a mother, drove over down virtual school and she said, I just want you to know that this was the best thing that's happened to my son. She said, it's not safe to play outside. He loved these gizmos. He spent the day doing gizmos. Robin checked the, the, the log. This child had gone through every single gizmo. I mean, there were 200 of them. 
Now, somebody might say, well, it'd be better if the child played outside or went to the playground or whatever. Uh, but the, the it depends is why so much of the, the zero one thinking that goes on is totally flawed. Is online better or worse than face to face? Well, in Michigan, for example, is it that, and in our own university we've debated this a lot, but if you're in the Upper Peninsula and your high school offers no AP physics class and you can get it online, the test is not would it have been better had it been face to face. The test is what what are your options? And so you think of this kid in inner city Detroit, able to get access to brilliantly produced instructional materials, better than most of us as teachers can personally develop, and could spend as much time as he wanted, and in the system, if we were thinking seriously as a school system, we could understand when is this child working, how often is he working. And that, uh, that's why this whole idea of what do kids do when school is out is more important for the products you're developing than what happens in school. And I don't want to discourage, focus on that, but the reality is in most schools is most kids are not going to have some significant amounts of time on a keyboard in, in a world of 30 kids in the classroom, 55 minute periods, bells ringing, and so forth. So I would urge you to think that, ask yourself at least with regard to your product, are you thinking, I want this to be used in schools? Or are you thinking, can I put it online, put it out there, nights, summers, weekends, your potential impact is just dramatically bigger. Not sure about the revenue stream, but uh, better. Um, so, that brings a question up. Is, is your question, is your software any good? And if I, if I went back to Atlanta, this was Photoshop somehow, but <laughs> if I went back to teaching Atlanta knowing what I know now, I say this to all the undergraduates, I would spend at least a third of my time in class coaching the kids when they go home what they can do nights, weekends, and summers. Because that's the future of lifelong learning. It doesn't matter if I'm a brilliant teacher for 55 minute periods of time 180 days. If I don't change the way they learn and open the horizon of lifelong learning out there. Um, this brings me then to my third point, which is uh, two years ago, Several of us began to think about, could we get a pathway to our PhD program that did not require people to come to campus and live for four or five years on a 25% or 50% graduate assistantship? You can't imagine the range of opinions among faculty about whether this was possible. But we went ahead in January, we announced that we would try it out. We were overwhelmed by the response 200 people contacted, uh, Robbins played a key role in this. We, they, this was the start in that summer. So eight weeks later, we had 30 completed applicants. And we decided we wanted 10, so we said, and they were amazingly talented people, because we, our description says, we want people who don't want to come to Michigan State, <laughs> who want to be a rigorous researcher, trained by one of the top ranked ed site programs in the country, but we want you to stay where you are. And in, in your case, I'm thinking of people in your businesses, in your companies, or people you know. We're looking for the absolute smartest people who think like researchers, but we don't want them to come to us for five years. The traditional model is you go study for four or five years, you get your PhD, you hope to get a job, you hope to then teach teachers, and then you hope to make a difference when those teachers go out to teach two or three years later. We need to compress that time frame because the rate of change is such that if we did that, we'd be preparing people to go out and talk about how to use an Apple II in the classroom or how to do what research on the Apple II showed about learning. So this was hugely successful. It's a fantastic cohort. They come to campus in the summer for two weeks. Everything else is online. And it is still challenging the faculty at a research one university like MSU to wrap their heads around this. But it has been hugely successful. We are, Robin has a bunch of these flyers. This is a shameless advertisement, but it, to tie it back together, we want more Warren Buckleighters. And we want more Chip Donahue's. And we want them in your companies. Your company might want to sponsor one of these. You may know somebody. You may be one of those people. 
you may be a graduate student who won't leave your university and come to our university <laughs> to But I'm dead serious about this. Just that I'm saying the model, everything is going online. It is going to change higher ed and K-12. And it offers chances of research of kinds you've never done before. We also need different doctoral students. We need doctoral students who want to be researchers, but we want them to stay right where they are and bring the best of research to bear in that setting. So with that, we've got the flyers. I'll talk to anybody, but I really, if you know anybody, we are, what we're looking for is the next Steve Jobs of educational software. We want to get some of the brightest and best and I look up, you all know them. I mean, you are right there. So uh, this is a very serious request. Look around. Someone may have a master's degree. They don't have to have a master's degree, but they think analytically. They are interested in the intersection of design and learning. Tell them to contact us because it would benefit you and us. Lastly, I would ask you this. Remember the famous thing when Jobs persuaded Scully to come to Apple? you want to sell sugar water the rest of your life or come with me and change the world? What I would say to you about your software, ask yourself, do you want to design sugar software? <laughs> or do you want to contribute to children's development? Way out there in their homes where you are going to have control over the substantial percentage of the time these children have while they're children. So it's, a, it's an ethical mandate to do what you're doing. And with that, I will stop.